Buenos días. Estamos muy felices de estar aquí con ustedes. Chris and I and two filmmakers spent June and July of 2011 living under one dollar a day. This wasn't your typical summer vacation. We spent just $56 each in eight weeks. We did this because we believe that understanding the reality of poverty is the first step in addressing the problem. Many of us have heard that 1.1 billion people live under a dollar a day. But we wanted to go beyond the statistic and understand what that really means. We wanted to answer two questions. How do the poor survive on only one dollar? And what financial services do they need in order to better their own lives? And as tends to be the case with most great ideas, this project was created in a bar. Emboldened with a little liquid creativity and bravery, we concocted a plan to put ourselves in poverty, to film it, and to share our experience with our peers. We knew the plan wasn't perfect, but we didn't want perfection to stand in the way of us taking action. What we never anticipated, though, was that that night would change the course of our lives, or that 544,000 people would watch our videos on YouTube and be a part of our journey. For two months, the beautiful highlands of Guatemala became our home. Unfortunately, though, this beauty was also backdrop to rampant poverty and malnourishment, with more than half of the country's population living in poverty, and more than 15% in extreme poverty. Now, we knew that we would never be able to replicate the extreme hardship experienced by the extreme poor. But we wanted to simulate two key aspects of it. First, the extreme poor often don't know when they're going to get paid. Their income is highly unpredictable. So instead of giving ourselves $1 each day, we took our budget for the summer, $56 each, and divided it into random incomes that we drew from a hat each morning. The, the amount that we drew from the hat was the amount that we got each day. Second, the extreme poor use a complex combination of financial instruments in order to survive. So at the beginning of the summer, we took a small loan of $126 in order to pay for our large ticket items, such as renting of a house, our fertilizer, seed, and a small plot of land to grow radishes on. Every two weeks, we paid an installment on this loan plus interest on our dollar a day budget. So besides becoming ex experienced radish farmers, what did we do in Guatemala for two months? We spent most of our time conducting informal and formal research. Um, and as students of economic development, we were interested in three things. How do the poor manage their money? What services do they do use in order to do so? And how can we improve these services in order to better fit their financial needs? But our most immediate need was to survive long enough to even begin our research. On the first night, I remember lying there on our dirt floor, listening to the sounds of Zach vomiting outside, and thinking that there was really no way we were going to last two months. And by the second week, we were struggling most from constant hunger and lethargy. In one journal entry on June 19th, I described how we tilled our neighbor's cornfield for an entire day without eating any food. Experiencing that level of manual labor on an empty stomach was a debilitating feeling that I will never forget. And this is a reality that faced many of our neighbors in Peña Blanca day after day. So what we wanted to do was get to know these neighbors, to build their trust so we could better learn from them and conduct our research. The trust was essential, because we were interviewing 12 families, exploring everything from their family size to levels of education, asset wealth, uh, inflows and outflows of capital, and lastly, what instruments do they use to manage their money. As our time continued there, our lives really became a routine. We'd like to show you a day in the life. What time is it? 6.45. He pulled a nine. No way! Dude, he's, he's good. Deliciously cold breakfast of rice and beans. 
What are we doing today? We are going to observe some microfinance borrowers, have a short interview with them, and begin our research. Like how many people live there? Like anything depends on like the soil content, which we have no idea about. It depends on like how much fertilizer we need. You just need to know how to farm, and we just like don't. So I mean, maybe when we go meet him tomorrow morning, let's ask him if he'll if he'd be willing to teach us. Gracias, Don Carlos. Sí, muchísimas gracias. The rice costs six quetzales, the beans cost six quetzales, and the lard costs 1.5 quetzales. We eat this meal for our entire Eight. day, which is three meals, day. divided by, by three, so it's around 16 cents for each meal. Thank you. 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 Thank Cómo estás? ¿Cómo estás? How? How are you? Sí. How are you? Qué How bien. You? Es tres How palabras. Este inglés. Este. Sí. Se llama candle. 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 Y en en qué uh, chico? Eh, candle. 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 El chico. Oh sí, es como el mismo. After eight weeks, we lost a combined 18 kilos struggled with Giardia and E. coli, and almost gave our parents a heart attack. Here's why. Chris looks pretty horrible, I must say. <laughs> so was this worth it? Absolutely. Our friends in Peña Blanca became the best teachers we have ever had in our lives. They brought, they, they took abstract concepts that we were learning in the classroom and made them real. Specifically, they taught us three secrets of the financial lives of the extreme poor. First, we learned that the poor are active money managers. It would seem that the poor are living hand to mouth, that they're putting together the small amount of income they have every day and spending it all, all on food and to only start this again the next day. But in reality, the poor's lives couldn't be any different. We learned that the poor have to budget their money intensely in order to not only pay for short-term needs such as food, emergencies, sickness, and times without income, but also long-term and more expensive needs such as their children's education, a house, and even starting a business for the future. Amazingly, all of this money management is done in their heads, and incredibly, it is very accurate. When we asked them, how do you keep this all straight in your mind, they told us that it was always on their mind, that all day that they were thinking about how they were going to budget their money. Our own experience showed this to be true. Chris and I were forced to continuously talk and think about how we were going to budget our money. How, how were we going to buy enough food for the week? Did we have enough firewood? Were we going to have enough money to pay off our small microfinance loan? And did we have enough money for soap? <laughs> Which, as you can see, was, was not very, you know, we didn't have a lot of money for soap. <laughs> so, this obsession with money and money management was so powerful because the difference between 50 cents meant if we were going to eat or not. And the second financial secret of the poor that we learned was that the, they, are, they manage their money using many different tools. Anthony, or Tono as he was commonly known in the neighborhood, 
was using four different financial tools to manage his average daily income of $10. This income supported his entire family of eight people. What he would do is he'd borrow and loan money to friends. He accumulated assets for resale, created savings clubs, and even used microfinance. The reason that he used so many different tools was that there wasn't one single tool that was adequate enough to meet both his short and his long-term needs. Tono is also a great example of how the poor can be incredibly innovative at designing services to meet their needs, services that are not available to them from local banks. What he did was start a savings club with 12 of his friends. These are commonly known as Roscas around the world. Some of you may have heard of them. So every month, each member would come together in a meeting and give $12. At the end of the meeting, the total sum of $144 would be randomly distributed to one of the people. They, for the rest of the year, they would then repeat this process every month until each member had received this lump sum of $144. What's really amazing about this system that they created is that if you receive your payment near the beginning of the cycle, it acts as a loan. But if you're one of the, the last people to receive it, the, uh, it functions more as a method of savings. The third financial secret was that flexibility and reliability are benefits that the poor are actually willing to pay for. The poor are able to improvise free services such as Tono's Rosca, but there are some downsides. You may receive your lump sum, your large sum of money, at the wrong time, not when you actually need it. Also, your fellow members may not be able to pay their monthly due, or at times they may even steal from you. This is why microfinance is attractive to the poor. Microfinance is a way to empower the poor to bring themselves out of poverty by providing reliable financial services that meet their financial needs. Microfinance is similar to a Rosca, but there are some key differences. You're not borrowing from your friends, you're borrowing from an informal institution. Also, you're receiving the amount of money immediately and when you need it. And finally, you don't have to rely on your friends to bring in that monthly income. Also, and finally, the difference is that you're paying interest. But what we learned is that the benefits from a reliable services provided by microfinance often outweigh the costs um, of this minimal interest. One of our friends from Peña Blanca was stuck in a truly sad situation. She explained to us that her husband was alcoholic, abusive, and adulterous, oftentimes wasting what little money the family had on drinks or on his mistress. As a result of having no other options, she was forced to hide money at different people's houses around the neighborhood. So we asked, what would, what would that be like to watch your husband waste your family's money and to see your kids go to bed hungry and to stay at home while their friends go to school. I couldn't imagine if I'd had to hide money from Zach in order to feed the four of us. But three years ago, she received a small microloan and began saving a little bit, amount, little bit of money each week with Grameen Guatemala, a local microfinance bank. With her loan, she was able to buy the raw materials that she needed to begin a weaving business. And then she began selling traditional clothing in the neighborhood and in the local town. With this business, she was able to improve both the health and the education of her family. Her three youngest children were able to attend school, a reality that was not possible for her oldest. And currently, she's building up a lump sum in savings in order to replace her kitchen floor to protect her feet from the cold and the infection. So what microfinance has done here is by putting the money in her hands, it has empowered her to make her own decisions about how to bring herself and her family out of poverty. So what other financial services do the poor need? We learned through our research that the financial lives of the poor are incredibly complex. And at the same time, we learned that there is no one solution to poverty, nor does there need to be. Microfinance is needed, but there are other targeted solutions that are also needed to help the poor save and invest. Social entrepreneurs from around the world have begun to create and innovate these, uh, these target ideas by leveraging technology and mobile banking in order to do so.
but we must help them expand and support these ideas. So why is this important? If there's one thing that we learned in Peña Blanca, it's that poverty is not only about statistics. Poverty is about hopes and dreams. If the poor aren't afraid to innovate, then neither should we. Por situación, por el escaso de recursos y todo, mis padres no pudieron darme estudios. Cuando yo recibí mi primer crédito fue el 17 de septiembre del año 2009. Eh, solicitar un préstamo, invertir en lo que es los en lo que son los tejidos o los trajes típicos y trabajar eh, con lo que uno gana en eso puede uno estudiar. Me compran, entonces cuando se venda queda la ganancia y yo invierto más, eh, hago más tejido cuando en el verano yo ahorro mi dinero. Y nos dio esos tres mil quetales, unas tres mil quetales, hicimos el piso y quedó, quedó, quedó bonito la casa. Ahora ya no filtra agua dentro de la casa. Es muy importante ahorrar, es mucho bueno porque mi madre sí le ha ayudado bastante. Si no hubiera el préstamo, sería, no tenía estudio de mis hermanos. Eso es lo que yo pienso hacer, solicitar un préstamo, de invertir en mi negocio, después ponerme a estudiar. Our time in Peña Blanca transformed our lives. It instilled in us a desire and a belief that we too can be change makers. Moving forward, we want to mobilize young people all over the world to develop and scale new solutions to global poverty. This is our goal with this documentary project that we're creating right now. And through partnerships with our, with our partner organizations, Whole Planet Foundation, Ashoka, and MFI Connect, we would like to find young social entrepreneurs to help support them, to, to help them, to, to help tell their stories, and to spread their impacts. Now, our goal remains clear, and that is to end extreme poverty. This is both our great challenge and our great opportunity. We ask you, our peers, not to hide from poverty and feel ashamed by it, but feel empowered that opportunities exist to help and that we can do something about it. By engaging young people in experiential learning, we will provide our generation with the tools to become change makers, to seek understanding, and to create bottom-up solutions that will finally end extreme poverty. This is our generation's great challenge. Muchísimas gracias. <laughs>